Coming up today, South Korea, the United States and Japan agree that the strongest ever sanctions are required to ensure North Korea pays for its recent nuclear test and rocket launch. Washington's top intelligence official says North Korea could be capable of harvesting weapons-grade plutonium within weeks and is on course to have an operational road mobile ICBM. First Soulbound expressways are expected to be congested today, the final day of the five-day Lunar New Year holiday. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, February 10th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, with the dust still settling on North Korea's second major provocation in the space of just over one month, the leaders of South Korea, the United States and Japan have agreed that Pyongyang has to be slapped with the strongest sanctions yet. Our presidential office correspondent, Song ji -son, starts us off. President Park Geun-hye spoke with the leaders of the United States and Japan by phone on Tuesday morning, where they exchanged views on North Korea's nuclear test last month and Sunday's rocket launch. The three leaders had also spoken the day after the North's fourth nuclear test on January 6. President Park stressed that North Korea cannot succeed in simultaneously advancing its nuclear program and its economic development, and that Pyongyang's test of ballistic missile technology cannot be accepted as it is a direct challenge to global peace and stability. President Obama said North Korea's launch is a clear violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions and a direct threat to the security of the United States and its allies. Washington also reaffirmed that the U.S. stands firm in abiding by its mutual defense treaty with South Korea. In response, President Biden expressed her appreciation for Washington's commitment to its allies and affirmed that maintaining a deterrent is the best way to counter the North nuclear programs. Soon after speaking with President Obama, President Buck spoke with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The two leaders reaffirmed their common goal of seeking the strongest and most effective UN resolution on North Korea, so the North pays price for its fourth nuclear test and the latest rocket launch. President Buck stressed the need for separate bilateral and multilateral sanctions on North Korea, in addition to UN Security Council resolution that's already in the works, with Abe responding that Tokyo is currently in the process of crafting its own set of sanctions on Pyongyang. Song ji -son, Arirang News. Now, the South Korean government is seeking stronger cooperation from the international community in dealing with North Korea's latest provocations, Seoul's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se has left for the U.S. and Germany for talks with UN Chief Ban Ki-moon and his U.S., German and possibly Russian counterparts. Kwon Soa with the details. South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se expressed his hope for stronger sanctions on North Korea than in the past before embarking on a trip to the United Nations headquarters in New York on Tuesday. That'll include a meeting with UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon, and Yoon is expected to ask for his cooperation in bringing about the swift adoption of new sanctions on Pyongyang. Yoon also vowed to push for greater support from the UN Security Council, whose 15 member states all agreed on the need for new measures against Pyongyang's latest missile launch. The UN Security Council released a strong statement. Based on that momentum, I will bolster efforts with UN members and key allies. And those efforts will include pushing China, North Korea's closest ally, to change its lukewarm stance toward tougher sanctions. China and Russia were considerably cooperative in issuing Sunday's statement. Various separate discussions with China are also in progress in Seoul, Beijing and at the UN. Minister Yoon will continue his diplomatic efforts in Germany, where he will undertake a three-day trip beginning Thursday to attend the annual Munich Security Conference. North Korea will be on the agenda there too, with Yoon slated to give a speech on South Korea's approach to Pyongyang.
He is also expected to hold several other meetings on the issue, including with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, Germany's foreign minister, and maybe with his Russian counterpart too. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, South Korea's defense ministry has confirmed that North Korea's recent rocket launch did put a satellite into orbit. Whether it actually works is another question. Kim Hyun Bin has the details. South Korea's defense ministry on Tuesday released its technical analysis of North Korea's recent rocket launch. The report, compiled by the Agency for Defense Development, says the Kwangmyongsong 4 satellite is in orbit and that the rocket's three stages separated successfully. The ministry added that it is trying to determine if the satellite is working properly, but said that no signals have been detected so far. U.S. officials with a similar analysis have been quoted by various media outlets, saying the satellite North Korea fired into space is, quote, tumbling in orbit and incapable of functioning in any useful way. Seoul's defense ministry says the rocket launched on Sunday is similar to that UNA-3 that was launched in December of 2012. North Korea's recent long-distance missile launch is similar to the previous missile launch in 2012. They compared the rocket's trajectory and the altitude at which the satellites entered orbit, which were the same for both. They also examined the time it took both rockets to put the satellite into orbit, which deferred by just 17 seconds. The UNA-3 had a maximum range of 10,000 kilometers, and the ministry says the range of the rocket launched Sunday is better by about 2,000 kilometers. The ministry also said that although North Korea has developed its intercontinental ballistic missile technology with this latest launch, it has not yet perfected the technology needed to bring a launch missile back to the atmosphere. South Korea was the first to detect the rocket just 50 seconds after it was fired, but the rocket disappeared from radar six minutes after the launch, which was also shortly after the rocket shed the fairing that encases the satellite. Seoul and Washington are conducting a joint investigation into the matter, including an analysis of the debris from the rocket's first stage. The ministry says it will be some time before it has any definitive results. Kim Hyun Bin, RDI News. The top intelligence official in the United States has warned that North Korea could have access to plutonium within a matter of weeks to months. Speaking to the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee on Tuesday local time, U.S. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper also said Pyongyang is believed to have taken, quote, initial steps, end quote, toward fielding a road mobile intercontinental ballistic missile. Clapper said North Korea could use spent fuel from its five megawatt reactor at its Yongbyon nuclear complex to recover enough weapons grade plutonium for one bomb a year. He also stressed that North Korea was committed to developing and close to fielding a long range nuclear arm missile that is capable of posing a direct threat to the US. Clapper noted how the regime, as you can see there, has publicly displayed its KN08 ICBM on many occasions. Now, in other news, heavy traffic congestion is expected on Seoul-bound expressways today, the final day of Korea's five-day Lunar New Year holiday. Korea Expressway Corporation forecasts traffic volume to start picking up from around uh, 9 a.m. in around three hours from now and peak at around 3 to 4 p.m. However, road conditions are expected to return to normal at around 7 to 8 p.m. since most people have uh, in fact, already returned home uh, over the past couple of days. Some 430,000 cars are estimated to be on the nation's expressways back to the capital on this Wednesday. Estimated drive times to major cities nationwide can be found on the Korea Expressway Corporation's official website. Now, if you're watching us in Korea, you'll probably be aware that we are now as we just mentioned, in the final day of the five-day Lunar New Year holiday. Throughout the break, we've been bringing you stories on all things holiday-related. In our final report, we're going to introduce you to a training program designed to help us find some peace in our stressful modern-day lives. EG1 with the details. This is the Dosan Seowon Sunbi Culture Training Center. About 74,000 people came here for training last year, and the number is growing by the year. Elementary school teachers are visiting the center for this session. But what do they want to get out of their training? 
I hope to learn about the five important ethics of Confucianism that characterize human nature like kindness, generosity, and righteousness. I want to learn more about what Sunbis used to study. During Korea's Joseon dynasty, founded in 1392, Confucianism was adhered to and widely studied by Sunbis. Sunbi refers to classical scholars who studied throughout their lives. Their studies included academic literature, martial arts, music, drawing, and more, all of which were part of their character building. Sunbis were highly respected not only for their knowledge and virtue, but because they fought for social justice, condemning corruption and taking rightful paths. At the center, people can brush up on important values they may have forgotten in their busy lives. People learn about the mind and spirit of Sunbi, which is to lower oneself and respect all human beings, but at the same time fight for what is right. They also learned why it's important in our society today. We help them practice that in their daily lives. The center is extra special as it's near the head house of one of Korea's most prominent Sunbis, Taeke Yihwang. Traces of Twege's life can be found everywhere. Twege is highly praised by many for putting his knowledge into practice and treating everyone fair and same, regardless of their social status. As part of the program, people learn about Twege Yihwang and visit the places he meditated, indirectly experiencing the life he had. They also visit Twege's house. They can seek advice on practicing the values of Sunbi from the eldest grandson of Tege's head family. They put on traditional costumes and pay respect to Tege. I felt very nervous and sacred when vowing to Tege. I feel honored to have this opportunity. Putting on the traditional costume and experiencing these cultures made me feel as if I were really communicating with Tege. By sharing the Sunbi culture and teachings of Tege, the center hopes to remind people of the forgotten virtues and righteousness. Lee ji Arirang News. Now we're going to shift gears here quite a bit because Japanese stocks plunged more than 5% on Tuesday and the yield on the benchmark government bond dropped into negative territory for the first time ever. It's the most dramatic consequence of the Bank of Japan's decision last month to introduce negative interest rates. Uh, Guan jang has the details. Global investors might have been hoping for a quiet week, with China and many markets in Asia closed for the Lunar New Year. But after markets in Europe and U.S. took a tumble on Monday, Japanese stocks followed suit, taking a turn for the worse on Tuesday. The Nikkei index dropped 5.4 percent for the biggest single-day drop since May 2013. The Topic index also fell by 5.5 percent. Tokyo's banks were the biggest losers, with Mitsubishi UFG and Sumitomo Mitsui both down more than 8 percent at market close. The yen also hit a 15-month high against the U.S. dollar during today's session. This affected export businesses, including Japan's auto industries, with Toyota, Honda, Nissan all dropping around 6 percent or more. There was also a historic turn with Japan's 10-year government bond yields turning negative for the first time. These movements came in spite of the Bank of Japan introducing negative interest rates less than two weeks ago to try and reinvigorate the economy. Global markets are now waiting for Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen to give word on Wednesday about future U.S. rate hikes. Elsewhere in Asia, Australia's S&P index plunged nearly 3 percent, while markets in the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand and New Zealand were also down. China's markets are closed all week for the Lunar New Year holiday. Hong Kong and South Korea will reopen on Thursday. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. Now, in some more positive economic news, it seems as though a huge market in South America could be about to open up for Korea's small and mid-sized firms. The Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, otherwise known as COTRA, says Korean sports mask brand Naru CME uh, CEM, rather, uh, has successfully launched its product line on Brazil's leading e-commerce website, Kanui. 
Now, it marks the first time a local small size company has advanced into the Brazilian e commerce market after President Park and Hay visited Brazil in April of last year. An official from Cotra said that while Brazil's economy is facing a slowdown, it's still a huge market. Uh, they added that e commerce could be an effective channel that could help Korean firms advance into the Brazilian market. Well, that's all we have for now on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you as always for tuning in and we'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. So until then, goodbye.